Jaws by Peter Benchley Read in six parts by John Garasio Part one The great fish moved silently through the night water propelled by short sweeps of its crescent tail The eyes were sightless in the black The fish survived only by moving Once stopped it would sink to the bottom and die of anoxia. The land seemed almost as dark as the water, for there was no moon. All that separated sea from shore was a long, straight stretch of beach, so white that it shone. In a house on the dunes, the front door opened, and a man and woman stepped out onto the porch. The man was drunk, and he stumbled on the bottom step. You go ahead. He said, I'll wait for you here. The woman rose and walked to where the gentle surf washed over her ankles. The water was colder than the night air, for it was only mid-June. The woman called back. You're sure you don't want to come? But there was no answer from the sleeping man. She backed up a few steps, then ran at the water and continued until it covered her shoulders. There she began to swim with the jerky, head-above-water stroke of the untutored. A hundred yards offshore, the fish sensed a change in the sea's rhythm. It did not see the woman, nor yet did it smell her. Running within the length of its body were a series of thin canals, filled with mucus and dotted with nerve endings. And these nerves detected vibrations and signaled the brain. The fish turned toward shore. The woman continued to swim away from the beach, stopping now and then to check her position by the light shining from the house. She was tiring, so she rested for a moment treading water and then started for shore. The vibrations were stronger now, and the fish recognized prey. The fish closed on the woman and hurtled past a dozen feet to the side and six feet below the surface. The woman felt only a wave of pressure that seemed to lift her up in the water and ease her down again. She stopped swimming and held her breath. Feeling nothing further, she resumed her lurching stroke. The fish smelled her now and began to circle close to the surface. Its dorsal fin broke water, and its tail, thrashing back and forth, cut the glassy surface with a hiss. A series of tremors shook its body. For the first time, the woman felt fear, though she did not know why. Adrenaline shot through her trunk and her limbs, urging her to swim faster. She guessed that she was 50 yards from shore. She could see the line of white foam where the waves broke on the beach. She saw the lights in the house, and for a comforting moment, she thought she saw someone pass by one of the windows. The fish was about 40 feet away from the woman, off to the side, when it turned suddenly to the left, dropped entirely below the surface, and with two quick thrusts of its tail, was upon her. At first, the woman thought she had snagged her leg on a rock or a piece of floating wood. There was no initial pain, only one violent tug on her right leg. She reached down to touch her foot, feeling in the blackness with her left hand. She could not find her foot. She reached higher on her leg and then she was overcome by a rush of nausea and dizziness. Her groping fingers had found a nub of bone and tattered flesh. She knew that the warm, pulsing flow over her fingers in the chill water was her own blood. Pain and panic struck together. The woman threw her head back and screamed. The fish had moved away. It swallowed the woman's limb without chewing. Bones and meat passed down the massive gullet in a single spasm. Now the fish turned again, homing on the stream of blood flushing from the woman's femoral artery. A beacon as clear and true as a lighthouse. This time, the fish attacked from below. It hurtled up under the woman, its jaws agape. The great conical head struck her like a locomotive, knocking her up out of the water. The jaws snapped shut around her torso, crushing bones and flesh and organs into a jelly. The fish, 
with the woman's body in its mouth, smashed down on the water, spewing foam and blood in a gaudy shower. The water was laced with blood and shreds of flesh. Most of the pieces of the corpse had dispersed. A few sank slowly, coming to rest on the sandy bottom, where they moved lazily in the current. Police patrolman Hendricks hung up the phone and looked at his watch. It was 5.10. The chief wouldn't be up for an hour, and Hendricks wasn't anxious to wake him for something as vague as a missing person report. On the other hand, if she was washed up somewhere, Chief Brody would want the whole thing taken care of before the body was found by some nanny with a couple of young kids and it became a public nuisance. Hendricks picked up the phone and dialed Chief Brody's home number. Yeah? Chief, this is Hendricks. I hate to bother you this early, but... What time is it? 5.20. Leonard, this better be good. I think we've got a floater on our hands, Chief. A floater? What in heaven's name is a floater? It was a word Hendricks had picked up from his reading. A drowning, he said. I didn't know if you'd want to check it out before people start swimming. Like I said, Chief, I hate to bother... Yeah, I know, Leonard. You were right to call. As long as I'm awake, I might as well get up. I'll see you later. They drove out in Brody's car. Brody looked up and down the beach. For as far as he could see, more than a mile in both directions, the beach was empty. Clumps of seaweed were the only dark spots on the white sand. Let's take a walk, he said. Hendricks started eastward. Ahead of him, he saw a clump of weed and kelp that seemed unusually large. When he reached the clump, he stopped. For a few seconds, he stared, frozen rigid. Snarled within the clump of weed was a woman's head, still attached to shoulders, part of an arm, and about a third of her trunk. In the cause of death space on the form, Chief Brody typed shark attack and leaned back in his chair. Now, he intended to close the beaches for a couple of days to give the shark time to travel far away from the Amity shoreline. He was determined to deprive the fish of any more people. This time, he wanted publicity to make people fear the water and stay away from it. He dialed Meadow's number. Hey, Harry, he said. Free for lunch? When Brody arrived, Meadows was standing beside his desk. About the dead woman, Brody said. I have a couple of thoughts. I do too, said Meadows. I called a young guy I know up at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. I described the body to him, and he said it's likely that only one kind of shark would do a job like that. What kind? A great white. There are others that attack people, but this fellow Hooper, Matt Hooper, told me that to cut a woman in half like that, you'd have to have a fish with a mouth like this. He spread his hands about three feet apart. And the only shark that grows that big and attacks people is the Great White. According to Hooper, the only thing good about Great Whites is that they're scarce. There's every reason to believe that the shark that attacked the Watkins girl is long gone. Seems to me, Martin, that there's no reason to get the public all upset over something that's almost sure not to happen again. If we tell people there's a killer shark around here, we can kiss the summer goodbye. But, Harry, there's a chance you're wrong, and I don't think we can take that chance. Meadows sat back in his chair and thought for a moment. There won't be any story about the attack in the leader. Minutes after Brody returned to his office, the intercom buzzer sounded. The mayor's here to see you, chief. Brody smiled. The mayor. Not Larry Vaughn. Not Lawrence Vaughn of Vaughn and Penrose Real Estate. But Mayor Lawrence P. Vaughn, the people's choice. Send his honor in, Brody said. Vaughn walked into Brody's office and sat down. I just talked to Harry Meadows, he said. Where are you going to get the authority to close the beaches? I don't want you to close the beaches. 
I'm sorry, Larry. I have to. I wouldn't be doing my job. You may not have your job much longer. If you don't do what's right, we'll put someone in your job who will. Brody had never seen Vaughn in a mood so aggressively ugly. He was fascinated, but he was also slightly shaken. You really do want this, don't you, Larry? Sensing victory, Vaughn said evenly, Trust me, Martin, you won't be sorry. Brody sighed. I don't like it. Doesn't smell good. But okay, if it's that important, it's that important. For the first time since he had arrived, Vaughn smiled. We do have one thing going for us. The victim was a nobody. A drifter, no family, no close friends. She'd hitchhiked east from Idaho, so she won't be missed. Brody arrived home a little before five. Ellen was in the kitchen, still dressed in the pink uniform of a hospital volunteer. Her hands were immersed in chopped meat, kneading it into a meatloaf. What was the crisis? she said, turning her head so Brody could plant a kiss on her cheek. You were at the hospital. You didn't hear? No. Today was Bay the Old Lady's Day. I never got off the Ferguson wing. A girl got killed off Old Mill. By what? A shark. Brody reached into the refrigerator and found a beer. Ellen stopped kneading meat and looked at him. A shark? Yeah, I know. It's a first for me, too. So what are you going to do? Nothing. There are some things I could do, technically, but there's nothing I can actually do. What you and I think doesn't carry much weight around here. The powers that be are worried that it won't look nice if we get all excited just because one stranger got killed by a fish. They're willing to take the chance that it was just a freak accident that won't happen again. Or rather, they're willing to let me take the chance, since it's my responsibility. What do you mean, the powers that be? Larry Vaughn, for one, came to see me as soon as he heard I planned to close the beaches. Said he'd have my job if I did close them. I can't believe that, Martin. Larry isn't like that. I didn't think so either. For the next few days, the weather remained clear and unusually calm. And after days of constant sun, the earth and sand had warmed. The little children played at the water's edge, digging holes and flinging muck at each other, unconscious and uncaring of what they were and what they would become. A boy of six stopped skimming flat stones out into the water. He walked up the beach to where his mother lay dozing and he flopped down next to her towel. Hey, Mom, he said. His mother turned to look at him, shielding her eyes from the sun. What? I'm bored. Oh, for God's sake, Alex. Can I go swimming? No, it's too cold. Can I go out in my raft? I won't go swimming. I'll just lie on my raft. His mother sat up and put on her sunglasses. Oh, all right, she said. Go ahead, but don't go too far out and don't go swimming. Okay. He stood up grabbed his rubber raft and dragged it down to the water. He picked up the raft, held it in front of him, and walked seaward. In 35 feet of water, the great fish swam slowly. A boy of six grabbed his rubber raft and dragged it down to the water. He picked up the raft, held it in front of him, and walked seaward. When the water reached his waist, he leaned forward. His feet and ankles hung over the rear of the raft. He moved out a few yards, then turned and began to paddle up and down the beach. Though he didn't notice it, a gentle current carried him slowly offshore. Fifty yards farther out, the ocean floor dropped precipitously. The water was fifteen feet deep where the slope began to change. Soon, it was 25, then 40, then 50 feet deep. In 35 feet of water, the great fish swam slowly, its tail waving just enough to maintain motion. The boy was resting, his arms dangling down, his feet and ankles dipping in and out of the water with each small swell. His head was turned toward shore, and he noticed that he had been carried out beyond what his mother would consider safe. 
He could see her lying on her towel, and the man and child playing in the wave wash. He was not afraid, for the water was calm, and he wasn't really very far from shore, only forty yards or so. But he wanted to get closer. Otherwise, his mother might sit up, spy him, and order him out of the water. He eased himself back a little bit so he could use his feet to help propel himself. He began to kick and paddle toward shore. His arms displaced water almost silently, but his kicking feet made erratic splashes and left swirls of bubbles in his wake. The fish did not hear the sound, but rather registered the sharp and jerky impulses emitted by the kicks. They were signals, faint but true, and the fish locked on them, homing. It rose, slowly at first, then gaining speed as the signals grew stronger. Nearly vertical, it now saw the commotion on the surface. The mouth opened, and with a final sweep of the sickle tail, the fish struck. The boy's last, only thought, was that he had been punched in the stomach. The fish's head drove the raft out of the water. The jaws smashed together, engulfing head, arms, shoulders, trunk, pelvis, and most of the raft. Nearly half the fish had come clear of the water, and it slid forward and down in a belly-flopping motion, grinding the mass of flesh and bone and rubber. The boy's legs were severed at the hip, and they sank, spinning slowly to the bottom. On the beach, the man with the child shouted, Hey! Did you see that? Did you see that? What, Daddy? What? Out there! Something huge! The boy's mother, half asleep on her towel, opened her eyes and squinted at the man. She saw him point towards the water and heard him say something to the child, who ran up the beach and stood by a pile of clothing. The man began to run towards the boy's mother and she sat up. She didn't understand what he was saying, but he was pointing out at the water, so she shaded her eyes and looked out to sea. At first, the fact that she saw nothing didn't strike her as odd. Then she remembered, and she said, Alex? Police Chief Brody was having lunch at home with Ellen. The phone rang. It's Bigsby, Chief said the voice from the station house. What is it, Bigsby? I think you better come down here. I've got this hysterical woman on my hands, Chief. What's she hysterical about? Her kid, out by the beach. A twinge of unease. What happened? It's... Bigsby faltered. Thursday. I'll be right there. What is it? asked Ellen. A kid just got killed. How? By a goddamn shark. No. If you had closed the beaches... She stopped, embarrassed. Yeah, said Brody. I know. The city edition of the New York Times lay in the center of Brody's desk. Brody read the headline, Shark Kills Two on Long Island. A young woman and a six-year-old boy have been killed in separate shark attacks near the beaches of this resort community. Asked why he had not ordered the beaches closed until the marauding shark was apprehended, Chief Brody said, Close the Amity beaches, and people would just drive up to East Hampton and go swimming there. And there's just as good a chance that they'd get killed in East Hampton as in Amity. After yesterday's attack, however, Chief Brody did order the beaches closed until further notice. Later that morning, when Brody entered his office through a side door, the boy's mother stood there clutching a handkerchief. She walked up to Brody. What can I do for you, Mrs. Kintner? The woman slapped the newspaper across his face. What about this? What about what? What they say there. That you knew it was dangerous to swim. That somebody had already been killed by that shark. That you kept it a secret. Brody didn't know what to say. Of course it was true, all of it, at least technically. He couldn't deny it, and yet he couldn't admit it either, because it wasn't the whole truth. Sort of, he said. I mean, yes, it, it's true, but it's... <sighs> Look, Mrs. Kintner, you killed Alex. You knew. You knew all along, but you wouldn't say. 
And now a six-year-old boy, a beautiful six-year-old boy, my boy. You knew. Why didn't you tell? Why? She clutched herself, wrapping her arms around her body as they would be wrapped in a straitjacket, and she looked into Brody's eyes. Why? Because we didn't think it could happen again. The woman was silent for a moment, letting the words register in her muddled mind. All of a sudden, as if a switch had been turned somewhere inside her, she slumped into the chair and began to weep in gasping, choking sobs. Brody sat on the public beach, his elbows resting on his knees to steady the binoculars in his hands. When he lowered the glasses, he could barely see the boat, a white speck that disappeared and reappeared in the ocean swells. Hey, Chief, Patrolman Hendricks said, walking up to Brody. Hey, Leonard, what are you doing here? I was just passing by and I saw your car. What are you doing? Trying to figure out what the hell Ben Garden is doing. Fishing, don't you think? That's what he's being paid to do. But it's the damnedest fishing I ever saw. I haven't seen anything move on that boat in an hour. Can I take a look? Brody handed him the glasses. Hendricks raised them and looked out to sea. No, nope, you're right. How long has he been out there? All day, I think. You want to go see? We've got at least two more hours of daylight. How do you plan to get out there? I'll borrow Chickering's boat. That'll get us out there. Brody felt a shimmy of fear skitter up his back. He was a very poor swimmer, and the prospect of being on top of, let alone in, water above his head gave him what his mother used to call the whim-whams. Sweaty palms, a persistent need to swallow, and an ache in his stomach. Okay, he said. I don't guess we've got much choice. You go get the boat ready. I'll stop off at headquarters and give his wife a call. Hendricks was standing in the boat, the engine running. What did she say? He asked as Brody approached. Not a word. She's been trying to raise him for half an hour, but she figures he must have turned off the radio. Pretty strange to turn off your radio when you're out alone. People don't do that. Let's go, Leonard. You know how to drive this thing? Ben Gardner's boat was about three quarters of a mile from shore. Brody saw no signs of life. Hey, Ben! Well, maybe he's below, said Hendricks. Brody called again. Hey, Ben! Their own boat nestled up against the flicker's gunnel. Brody grabbed the gunnel. Hendricks took a line and made it fast to a cleat. You want to go on board? Yeah. Brody climbed aboard the flicker. Hendricks followed, and they stood in the cockpit. Hendricks poked his head through the forward hatch. You in there, Ben? Not there. He's not on board, said Brody. No two ways about it. What's that stuff? said Hendricks, pointing to a bucket in the corner of the stern. Brody walked to the bucket and bent down. A stench of fish and oil filled his nose. The bucket was full of guts and blood. Must be chum, he said. Fish guts and other stuff. You spread it around in the water and it's supposed to attract sharks. A sudden noise made Brody jump. Whiskey Zebra Echo 259, huh? This is the pretty bell. You there, Jake? So much for that theory, said Brody. He never did turn off his radio. I don't get it, Chief. There are no rods. He didn't carry a dinghy, so he couldn't have rowed away. He swam like a fish, so if he fell overboard, he would have just climbed back on. Brody felt something strange and looked down. There were four ragged screw holes where a cleat had been. The screws had obviously not been removed by a screwdriver. The wood around the holes was torn. Look at this, Leonard. Hendricks ran his hand over the holes. He looked to the port side where a ten-inch steel cleat still sat securely on the wood. You imagine that what was here was as big as the one over there? He said. What in hell's name would it take to pull that mother out? Then, a pattern began to take shape. 
a pattern of holes, deep gouges in the wooden transom, forming a rough semicircle more than three feet across. And at the bottom of the transom, just at the waterline, three short smears of blood. Please God, thought Brody, not another one. Come here, Leonard. Hendricks walked to the stern and looked over. What? If I hold your legs, you think you can lean over and take a look at those holes down there and try to figure out what made them? What do you think made them? I don't know. That's something. I want to find out what. Come on. If you can't dope it out in a minute or two, we'll forget about it and go home. Okay? I guess so. Hendricks lay on top of the transom. Hold me tight, Chief. Please. Brody leaned down and grabbed Hendricks's feet. He took one of Hendricks's legs under each arm and lifted. Hendricks rose, then bent over the transom. Okay, said Brody. A little more. Okay, that's it. Hendricks began to examine the holes. What if some shark came along right now? He could grab me right out of your hands. Don't think about it. Just look. I'm looking. In a few moments, he said, Wow! Look at that thing! Hey, pull me up! Brody stepped backward, hoisting Hendricks to the deck. Let's see, he said, holding out his hand. Into Brody's palm, Hendricks dropped a triangle of glistening white denticle. It was nearly two inches long. The sides were tiny saws. Brody scraped the tooth against the gunnel, and it cut the wood. He looked out over the water and shook his head. My God, he said. It's a tooth, isn't it? Said Hendricks. You think the shark got Ben? I don't know what else to think, said Brody. He looked at the tooth again, then dropped it into his pocket. We might as well go. There's nothing we can do here. It was almost 8 o'clock when they arrived at police headquarters. Harry Meadows, the editor of Amity's newspaper, The Leader, and another man, unknown to police chief Brody, were waiting for them. Meadows gestured towards the man beside him. This is Matt Hooper. He was young, mid-twenties, Brody thought, and handsome. The two men shook hands. You're the fella from Woods Hole who knows about fish, Brody said. That's right, said Hooper. What did you find out there? Meadows asked. We found this, said Brody. He flipped the tooth to Hooper, who turned it over in his hand. It's a white, said Hooper. How big? Fifteen, twenty feet. That's some fantastic fish. He looked at Meadows. Thanks for calling me, he said. I could spend a whole lifetime around sharks and never see a fish like that. Do you have any thoughts about what happened? Meadows asked. From what the chief says, it sounds like the fish killed Mr. Gardner. How? said Brody. Any number of ways. Gardner might have fallen overboard. More likely, he was pulled over. He could even have been taken while he was leaning over the stern. Well, how do you account for the teeth in the stern? The fish attacked the boat. Do you have any idea why he's hung around here so long? It's impossible to say. It's definitely uncharacteristic. Right now, anyway, that's as good an answer as I've got. Well, that's encouraging said Brody. Is there anything you plan to do to get an answer? I'll try to find that shark, which reminds me, is there a boat available? Yes, I'm sorry to say, said Brody. Ben Gardner's. We'll get you out to it tomorrow. Brody looked into Hooper's eyes and said, I want that fish killed. If you can't do it, we'll find someone who can. Brody turned to Meadows. What about it, Harry? Isn't there any fisherman on this whole damn island equipped to catch big sharks? Meadows thought for a moment. There may be one. I don't know much about him, but I think his name is Quint. I can find out a little more about him if you like. Why not? said Brody. He sounds like a possible. Hooper said, Look, Chief, trying to get retribution against a fish is crazy. Listen, you. Brody was growing angry an anger born of frustration and humiliation. The fish was an enemy. It had come upon the community and killed a man, a woman, and a child. The people of Amity would demand the death of the fish. 
They would need to see it dead before they could feel secure enough to resume their normal lives. Most of all, Brody needed it dead, for the death of the fish would be a catharsis for him. Hooper had touched that nerve, and that infuriated Brody further. But he swallowed his rage and said, Forget it. The phone rang. It's for you, Chief. Mr. Vaughn. Oh, swell. That's just what I need. He hadn't yet forgiven Vaughn for persuading him to keep open the beaches. He picked up the receiver. Yeah, Larry. Hello, Martin. How are you? As well as could be expected, Larry. You're working pretty late. I tried to get you at home. Yeah, well, when you're the chief of police and your constituents are getting themselves killed every 20 minutes, that kind of keeps you busy. I heard about Ben Gardner. You're sure it was the shark again? Nothing else seems to make any sense. Martin, what are you going to do? That's a good question, Larry. We're doing everything we can right now. We've got the beaches closed down. We've... I'm aware of that, to say the very least. What's that supposed to mean? Have you ever tried to sell healthy people real estate in a leper colony? No, Larry. I haven't had a new customer in here since Sunday. So what do you want me to do? What would you say to opening the beaches just for the 4th of July weekend? Not a chance. Not a stinking chance. Now listen. No, you listen, Larry. The last time I listened to you, we had two people killed. If we catch that fish, if we kill the son of a bitch, then we'll open the beaches. Until then, forget it. Martin, for God's sake, man, this town is dying. I know it, Larry. And as far as I know, there's not a damn thing we can do about it. Good night. He hung up the phone. Ellen was sitting up in bed reading Cosmopolitan. Tough day, she said. A tough day. You heard about Ben Gardner? Yes, it's so horrible. What do you think Sally will do? I don't know. Have you made any progress? You mean about catching that damn thing? No. Meadows called that oceanographer friend of his down from Woods Hole, so he's here. Not that I see what good he's gonna do. What's he like? He's all right, I guess. He's young. Decent-looking guy. He's a bit of a know-it-all, but that's not surprising. He seems to know the area pretty well. What's his name? Hooper. Not David Hooper. No, I think his name is Matt. Oh, only I went out with a David Hooper a long time ago, and I remember. But before she could finish the sentence, her eyes shut, and soon she slipped into the deep breathing of sleep. On Friday noon, Brody's wife Ellen stopped at Amity Hardware and went inside. What can I do for you? said Albert Morris. The rubber nozzle in my kitchen sink is all cracked, said Ellen. I want to get a new one. This what you had in mind? Perfect. As he rang up the sale on the register, Morris said, Lots of people upset about this shark thing. They think the beaches ought to be opened up again. Well, I... You ask me. I think your Martin's doing right. I'm glad to know that, Albert. Maybe this new fella can help us out. Who's that? This fish expert from up Massachusetts. Oh, yes, I heard he was in town. He's right here. Just then, Ellen heard footsteps on the stairs. She turned and saw Hooper coming through the door. He walked over to the counter, smiled politely at Ellen, and said to Morris, These'll do fine. He handed Morris a twenty-dollar bill. Ellen looked at Hooper, trying to define her reminiscence. You aren't by any chance related to David Hooper, are you? He's my older brother. Do you know David? Yes, said Ellen. I went out with him a long time ago. I'm Ellen Brody. I used to be Ellen Shepard. Back then, I mean. Oh, sure. I remember you. You don't. I do. I was probably in love with you. Oh. Ellen reddened. She thanked Morris and, with Hooper behind her, walked out of the store. So, now you're a scientist, she said when they were outside. What I got hooked on in college was fish, or to be really specific, sharks. Tell me about yourself. No, don't. Let me guess. Your husband is, let's see, a lawyer. Not quite. My husband is the police chief in Amity. Hooper let the surprise show in his eyes for only an instant. Of course. 
Brody, I met your husband last night. He seems like... quite a guy. Ellen thought she detected a flicker of irony in Hooper's voice. How long will you be here? She said. Well, that depends on what happens with this fish. As soon as he leaves, I'll leave. Hooper held out his hand. It's been really great to see you again. And I hope I'll see you before I go. I'd like that, said Ellen, shaking his hand. She stood up and watched as Hooper started the car, maneuvered out of the parking space and pulled out into the street. Then he turned the corner and was gone. Brody awoke with a start. He threw his arm across the bed to touch Ellen. She wasn't there. He sat up and saw her sitting in the chair by the window. Rain splashed against the window panes, and he heard the wind whipping through the trees. Lousy day, huh? he said. How come you're up so early? I've got a full day at the hospital. I didn't know you worked a full day Wednesdays. I don't usually, but one of the other girls is sick, and I said I'd fill in. Oh, I'll be back by supper time. Fine. Brody left. Ellen looked at the clock on the kitchen wall. It was a few minutes to eight. She found the number for the Abelard Arms Inn and dialed the number. Mr. Hooper's room, please. Matt Hooper? Ellen heard the phone ring once, then again. She could hear her heart beating, and she saw the pulse throb in her right wrist. Hang up, she told herself. Hang up. There's time. Hello? Said Hooper's voice. Hello? Ellen swallowed and said, Hi, it's me. I mean, it's Ellen. Oh, hi. I hope I didn't wake you. Not a very nice day, is it? I was wondering if there was any chance you'd like to... if you're free for lunch. Lunch? You mean you and the chief and me? No, just you and I. I mean, if you've got a lot of work to do... No, no, that's... okay. Heck, why not? What did you have in mind? Well, there's a wonderful place up in Sag Harbor. The Banners. I could meet you there whenever you like. How many times all right with me? Around 12.30, then? Ellen hung up the phone. Ellen arrived back home a little before 4.30. She went upstairs into the bathroom and turned on the water in the tub. She took off all her clothes and stuffed them into the laundry hamper. She looked in the mirror and examined her face and neck. No marks. After her bath, she powdered herself, brushed her teeth, and gargled with mouthwash. She went into the bedroom, put on a fresh pair of underpants and a nightgown, pulled back the bedclothes, and climbed into bed. She closed her eyes hoping that sleep would pounce upon her. But sleep could not overpower a memory that kept sliding into her mind. It was a vision of Hooper, eyes wide and staring as he approached Climax. Ellen had become afraid. Of what, she wasn't sure. But the ferocity and intensity of his assault seemed to her a pursuit in which she was only a vehicle. Later, during their subsequent coupling... Hooper had been more gentle, more controlled, less detached. But the fury of the first encounter still lingered disturbingly in Ellen's mind. Finally, her mind gave in to fatigue, and she fell asleep. Almost instantly, it seemed, she was awakened by a voice that said, Hey there, are you okay? She opened her eyes and saw Brody sitting on the end of the bed. I tried you at the hospital a couple of times. They said they thought you'd come home. That's right, I did. I felt awful. My thyroid pills aren't doing what they should, so I came home. Then I tried to reach you here, said Brody. Oh my, it must have been important. No, it was nothing important. He waited a moment to see if she was going to say anything else, and when it was clear she wasn't, he said, So, where were you? I told you, here. The words came out more harshly than she had intended. I came home and went to bed, and that's where you found me. And you didn't hear the phone. It's right there. Brody pointed to the bed table near the other side of the bed. No, I... I took a pill. 
The moaning of the damned won't wake me after I've taken one of those pills. Have you heard from Hooper? Brody said. Ellen said, He called this morning. Why? I tried to get a hold of him today, too. Around midday and a couple of times during the afternoon. The hotel said they didn't know where he was. What time did he call here? Just after you left for work. Did he say what he was going to be doing? He said... He said he might try to work on the boat, I think. I really don't remember. Well, that's funny. What is? I stopped by the dock on my way home. The harbor master said he hadn't seen Hooper. All day. On Thursday morning, Brody got a call summoning him to Mayor Vaughn's office for a noon meeting. He knew what the subject of the meeting was, opening the beaches for the 4th of July weekend that would begin the day after tomorrow. Brody was convinced opening the beaches would not be a solution or a conclusion. It would be a gamble that Amity and Brody could never really win. They would never know for certain that the shark had gone away. They would be living from day to day, hoping for a continuing draw. And one day, Brody was sure they would lose. As soon as he was inside the office, Brody knew he would be fighting alone. When everyone was seated, Vaughn said, You all know why we're here. And I guess it's safe to say that there's only one of us that needs convincing about what we should do. You mean me, said Brody. Vaughn nodded. Look at it from our point of view, Martin. The town is dying. People are out of work. Stores that were going to open aren't. People aren't renting houses, let alone buying them. And every day we keep the beaches closed, we drive another nail into our own coffin. We're saying this town is unsafe. Stay away from here. And people are listening. Suppose you do open the beaches for the fourth, Larry, said Brody. And suppose someone gets killed. It's a calculated risk, but I think, we think, it's worth taking. Why? Matt Hooper stood at a southerly window looking out to sea. Several reasons, said Hooper. First of all, nobody's seen the fish in a week. I've been on the boat looking for him every day. Every day but one. I meant to ask you about that, said Brody. Where were you yesterday? It rained said Hooper. Remember? So, what did you do? I just... He paused momentarily, then said, I studied some water samples and read. In your hotel room? A part of the time, yeah. What are you driving at? I called your hotel. They said you were out all afternoon. So I was out. I don't have to report in every five minutes, do I? No, but you're here to do a job. Listen, mister, you're not paying me. Anyway, I haven't seen a trace of that fish, not a sign. All you're doing is guessing, Brody said. Vaughn said, The shark is gone, Martin. As far as I'm concerned, there's only one way to go. You mean the decision's been made, said Brody. You could say that, yes. And when someone else gets killed, who's taking the blame this time? Who's going to talk to the husband or the mother or the wife and tell them we were just playing the odds? and we lost. Don't be so negative, Martin. When the time comes, if the time comes, and I'm betting it won't, we'll work that out then. All right. But if I open the beaches, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to post men out there, and I'm going to have Hooper patrol in the boat, and I'm going to make sure every person who comes down there knows the danger. You can't do that, Vaughn said. You might as well leave the damn things closed. I can do it, Larry, and I will. On Friday night, Brody called the Coast Guard for a weather report. He knew he should wish for beautiful weather for the three-day holiday weekend. It would bring people to Amity, and if nothing happened, if nothing was sighted, by Tuesday he might begin to believe the shark had gone. Then there'd be no reason for the marine biologist to hang around. Brody wanted Matt Hooper to leave Amity and go back to his home in Woods Hole. He sensed that somehow Hooper had come into his home. 
There was that business on Wednesday when Ellen had said she was sick, came home early from work. But where had Hooper been that day? Why had he been so evasive when Brody had asked him about it? For the first time in his married life, Brody was wondering, and the wondering filled him with an uncomfortable ambivalence. Self-reproach for questioning Ellen, and fear that there might actually be something to wonder about. Brody had said he would call Hooper as soon as he talked to the Coast Guard. He was standing at the kitchen phone. Ellen was washing the supper dishes. Brody knew Hooper was staying at the Abelard Arms. He saw the phone book buried beneath a pile of bills, notepads, and comic books on the kitchen counter. He started to reach for it, then stopped. I have to call Hooper, he said. You know where the phone book is? It's 6543, said Ellen. What is? The Abelard. That's the number, 6543. How do you know? I have a memory for phone numbers. You know that. I always have. He did know it, and he cursed himself for playing stupid tricks. He dialed the number. Abelard Arms! It was a male voice, young, the night clerk. Matt Hooper's room, please. You don't happen to know the room number, sir. No. Brody cupped his hand over the mouthpiece and said to Ellen, You don't happen to know the room number, do you? She looked at him, and for a second she didn't answer. Then she shook her head. The clerk said, Here it is, 405. The phone rang twice before Hooper answered. This is Brody. Yeah. Brody faced the wall, trying to imagine what the room looked like. He conjured visions of a small, dark garret, a rumpled bed, stains on the sheets, the smells of rut. He felt briefly that he was going out of his mind. I guess we're on for tomorrow, he said. The weather report is good. Yeah, I know. Then I'll see you down at the dock. What time? 9.30, I guess. Nobody's going to go swimming before then. Okay, 9.30. Brody hung up the phone and turned to Ellen. I think it's time you got some sleep. Why do you say that? That's the second time you've washed that glass. Saturday noon, Brody stood on a dune overlooking the Scotch Road beach. The Coast Guard had been right. The day was splendid, cloudless and warm, with a light onshore breeze. The beach was now crowded. No one had yet gone swimming. Brody took out the walkie-talkie. Hooper, this is Brody. Anything out there? There was no answer. This is Brody calling Hooper. Can you hear me? Sorry, I was out on the stern of the boat. I thought I saw something. What did you see? Can't really describe it. A shadow. Nothing more. The sunlight can fool you. I'll be in front of the public beach in a minute or two. Brody had become so accustomed to the far-off, barely audible hum of the flicker's engine that it was as integral a part of the beach as the wave sound. Suddenly, the engine's pitch changed from a low murmur to an urgent growl. Brody saw the boat in a tight, fast turn. He put the walkie-talkie to his mouth and said, You see something, Hooper? Brody saw the boat slow, then stop. Yes. It was that shadow again. Well, there's a kid swimming out there. Where? Thirty, maybe forty yards out. I think I'd better tell him to come in. Hey, out there! Come on in! The boy did not hear the call. He was swimming straight away from the beach. Brody said into the walkie-talkie, Hooper, he doesn't hear me. You want to toot in here and tell him to come ashore? Sure. I'll be there in a minute. The fish had sounded now and was meandering a few feet above the sandy bottom, 80 feet below the flicker. For hours, its sensory system had been tracking the strange sounds above. Twice, the fish had risen to within a yard or two of the surface, allowing sight and smell and nerve canals to assess the creature passing noisily overhead. Twice it had sounded, compelled neither to attack nor move away. Brody saw the boat, which had been facing westward, swing toward shore and kick up a shower of spray from the bouncing bow. 
below. The fish turned, banking as smoothly as an airplane, and followed the receding sound. It took Hooper only 30 seconds to cover the couple of hundred yards and draw near the boy. The boy heard the engine and he raised his head. What's the matter? Nothing, said Hooper. Keep swimming. The boy lowered his head and swam. A swell caught him and moved him faster, and with two or three more strokes he was able to stand. The water was up to his shoulders and he began to plod toward shore. Come on, said Brody. Hooper put the boat in reverse to back away from the waves. As he looked off the stern, he saw a silver streak moving in the gray-blue water. And even when the realization struck, he did not see the fish clearly. He cried, Look out! What is it? The fish! Get the kid out! Quick! The boy heard Hooper, and he tried to run. But in the chest-deep water, his movements were slow and labored. A swell knocked him sideways. Brody ran into the water and reached out. A wave hit him in the knees and pushed him back. The boy was moving faster now, pushing through the water with his chest and arms. He did not see the fin rise behind him, a sharp blade of brownish gray that hovered in the water. Hurry, said Brody. He reached for the boy. The boy's eyes were wide and panicked. His nostrils flared, bubbling with mucus and water. Brody's hand touched the boy's and he pulled. He grabbed the boy around the chest and together they staggered out of the water. The fin dropped beneath the surface and following the slope of the ocean floor, the fish moved into the deep. Brody stood in the sand with his arm around the boy. Are you okay? He said. The boy shivered. Brody saw his walkie-talkie wallowing in the wave wash. He retrieved it, wiped it free of water, pushed the talk button, and said, Leonard, can you hear me? I read you, Chief. Over. The fish has been here. If you've got anybody in the water down there, get them out. Right away. And stay there till we get relief for you. Nobody goes near the water. The beach is officially closed. At six o'clock, Brody sat in his office with Hooper. Brody took a phone book from the top drawer of his desk and opened it to the queues. He ran his finger down the page and dialed the number. Quint, said a voice. Mr. Quint, this is Martin Brody. I'm the chief of police over in Amity. We have a problem. I've heard. The shark was around again today. What I'm wondering is whether you can help us. I thought you might call. Well, can you? That depends. We'll pay whatever the going rate is. My everyday rate's two hundred a day. But this is special. I think you'll pay double. Brody paused. Okay, he said finally. I guess we don't have any choice. No, you don't. Can you start tomorrow? Nope. Monday's the earliest. And there's one more thing. I'm going to need a mate. Brody looked across his desk at Hooper. The last thing he wanted was to spend days on a boat with Hooper, especially in a situation in which Hooper would outrank him in knowledge if not authority. Brody cupped his hand over the mouthpiece and said to Hooper, Do you want to come along? He needs a mate. Yes, said Hooper. I'll probably live to regret it, but yes, I want to see that fish, and I guess this is my only chance. Brody said to Quint, Okay, I've got your man. Does he know boats? He knows boats. Monday morning, said Quint. Six o'clock. The sea was as flat as gelatin. The boat sat still in the water, drifting imperceptibly in the tide. Two fishing rods in rod holders at the stern trailed wire line into the oily slick that spread westward behind the boat. Matt Hooper, the marine biologist, sat at the stern, a 20-gallon garbage pail at his side. Every few seconds, he dipped a ladle into the pail and spilled it overboard into the slick. Police Chief Martin Brody sat in the swiveled fighting chair bolted to the deck, trying to stay awake. He was hot and sticky. There had been no breeze at all during the six hours they had been sitting and waiting. Brody looked up at the figure on the flying bridge. Quint, the boat's captain. Brody guessed Quint was about 50. 
He was about six feet four and very lean, and he wore a Marine Corps fatigue cap. Brody said to Quint, Suppose the Big White did come around. What would be the first thing you'd do? Try to keep him interested enough so he'd stick around till we could get at him. Squid isn't enough to keep him interested. Fish that size will suck a squid right down and not even know he's at it. So we'll have to give him something special that he can't turn down. Something with a big old hook in it that'll hold him at least until we can stick him once or twice. From the stern, Hooper said, What's something special, Quint? Quint smiled and pointed to a green plastic garbage can nestled in a corner amidships. Take a look for yourself. It's in that can. I've been saving it for a fish like the one we're after. Hooper walked over to the can, flipped the metal clasps off the sides and lifted the top. His shock at what he saw made him gasp. Floating vertically in the can full of water, its lifeless head swaying gently with the motion of the boat, was a tiny bottlenose dolphin, no more than two feet long. Hooper clutched the sides of the can and said, A baby? Even better, Quint said with a grin. Unborn. Look, Quint, said Hooper. These dolphins are in danger of being wiped out, extinguished, and what you're doing speeds up the process. Brody intervened. Listen, damn you. We're out here to stop a fish from killing people. And if using one porpoise will help us save God knows how many lives, that seems to me a pretty good bargain. Hooper smirked and said to Brody, So, now you're an expert on saving lives, are you? Let's see, how many could have been saved if you'd closed the beaches after the... Brody was on his feet moving at Hooper before he consciously knew he had left his chair. You shut your mouth, he said. Reflexively, he dropped his right hand to his hip. He stopped short when he felt no holster at his side, scared by the sudden realization that if he had had a pistol, he might have used it. He stood facing Hooper, who glowered back at him. A quick, sharp laugh from Quint broke the thread of tension. What a pair of dumbheads, he said. I seen that coming since you came aboard this morning. The second day of the hunt was as still as the first. When they left the dock at six in the morning, a light southwest breeze was blowing, promising to cool the day. The passage around Montauk Point was choppy, but by ten the breeze had died, and the boat lay motionless on the glassy sea, like a paper cup in a puddle. Brody did not want to have to fill time with conversation. Conversation that might lead to a repeat of yesterday's scene with Hooper. It had embarrassed him. Cooper, too, he thought. Today they seldom spoke to one another, directing most of their comments at Quint. Brody did not trust himself to feign civility with Hooper. For the next hour they sat in silence. Brody dozed in the fighting chair by the rod holder, a hat pulled down over his face to protect it from the sun. Hooper sat at the stern, ladling fish guts into the water and occasionally shaking his head to keep awake. And Quint sat on the flying bridge, watching the slick his Marine Corps cap tilted back on his head. Suddenly, Quint said, We've got a visitor. Brody snapped awake. Hooper stood up. The starboard line was running out smoothly and very fast. Take the rod, Quint said. Brody took the rod out of the holder, fitted it between his legs and held on. When I tell you, said Quint, you throw that brake and hit him. The line stopped running. Wait. He's turning. He'll start again. Don't want to hit him now or he'll spit the hook. But the line lay dead in the water, limp and unmoving. After several moments, Quint said, I'll be goddamned. Reel it in. Brody cranked the line in. It came easily. Too easily. There was not even the mild resistance of the bait. Whatever that was took the bait gentle as you please, Quint said. <laughs> Must have kissed it off the line. The line came clear of the water and hung at the tip of the rod. There was no hook, no bait, no leader. The wire had been neatly severed. I think we've just met your friend. What? said Brody. I'd bet on it. This wire's been chewed clean through. One try, no hesitation. Adrenaline was pumping through Brody's body. 
He was both excited and afraid, awed by the thought of what was swimming below them, a creature whose power he could not imagine. We'll give him one more chance, said Quint. I'll put on a tougher leader. From a drawer in the cockpit, he took a four-foot length of three-eighths inch chain. Well, that looks like a dog's leash, said Brody. Used to be, said Quint. He wired one end of the chain to the eye of the baited hook, the other to the wire line. Can he bite through that? I imagine so. All I'm trying to do is goose him a little and bring him to the surface. Quint flipped the bait hook overboard and fed out a few yards of line. Come on, you bugger, he said. Let's have a look at you. The three men watched the port line. Cooper bent down. Something caught his eye and made him turn. My God. No more than ten feet off the stern, slightly to the starboard, was the flat conical snout of the fish. It stuck out of the water perhaps two feet. The top of the head was sooty gray, pocked with two black eyes. At each side of the end of the snout, where the gray turned to cream white, were the nostrils, deep slashes in the armored hide. The mouth was open not quite halfway, a dim, dark cavern guarded by huge, triangular teeth. Fish and men confronted each other for perhaps ten seconds. Then Quint yelled, Get an iron! And obeying himself, he dashed forward and began to fumble with a harpoon. Brody reached for the rifle. Just then, the fish slid quietly backward into the water. The long, scythe tail flicked once. Brody shot at it and missed. And the fish disappeared. He's gone, said Brody. That fish is everything I thought and more, said Hooper. He's fantastic. The head must have been four feet across. Would be, said Quint, walking aft. God, I hope he comes back, said Hooper. Brody felt a chill and he shuddered. That was very strange, he said, shaking his head. He looked like he was grinning. Don't make him out to be more than he is, said Quint. He's just a dumb garbage bucket. As Quint spoke, a noise behind Hooper made him turn. It was a swishing noise, a liquid hiss. Heading straight for the boat, thirty feet away, was a triangular dorsal fin more than a foot high, knifing the water and leaving a rippled wake. It was followed by a towering tail that swatted left and right in tight cadence. It's attacking the boat, cried Brody. Involuntarily, he backed into the seat of the fighting chair and tried to draw away. The fish was almost at the boat. It raised its flat head, gazed vacantly at Hooper with one of its black eyes, and passed under the boat. Quint raised the harpoon and turned back to the port side. The throw pole struck the fighting chair and the dart disappeared and fell to the deck. Your side! Your side! yelled Hooper. He's past this side already! Quint turned back in time to see the gray-brown shape of the fish as it pulled away from the boat and began to dive. He dropped the harpoon and, in a rage, snatched up the rifle and emptied the clip into the water behind the fish. Bastard, he said. He looked at Brody and said, Gave you a bit of a start. More than a bit, said Brody. They waited for three more hours, but the fish never returned. At a little after five, Quint said, We might as well go in. I guess I can't blame you, said Brody. Your wife must like it better, too, having you home. Quint said flatly, Got no wife. I never saw the need for one. He turned and climbed the ladder to the flying bridge. The next day of the hunt was as still as the first. Quint stood with his back to his boat. Brody and Hooper stood on each side of an aluminum cage. The cage was slightly over six feet tall and six feet wide and four feet deep. What the hell is it anyway? said Quint. It's a shark cage, said Hooper. Divers use them to protect themselves when they're swimming in the open ocean. And what do you plan to do with it? When we find the fish, or when the fish finds us, I want to go down in the cage and take some pictures. Not a chance, said Quint. Not on my boat, Hooper said to Quint. I'll pay you. Oh, yeah? How much? Forget it, said Brody. I don't care what Quint says. I say you're not bringing that thing along. Hooper ignored him and said to Quint, A hundred dollars. Cash. He reached into his back pocket for his wallet. I said no, said Brody. What do you say, Quint? 
He counted five twenties and held them out to Quint. Quint reached for the money and said, Hell, I don't suppose it's my business to keep a man from killing himself if he wants to. And if the cage doesn't go, said Hooper, I don't go. Fine by me, said Brody. Stay here and play around with your fish. That's not all I'll play around. Oh, forget it. For several seconds, a leaden silence fell over the three men. Brody stared at Hooper. Then suddenly he was overcome by rage. He reached Hooper in two steps, grabbed both sides of his collar, and rammed his fists into Hooper's throat. What was that? He said. What did you mean by that? Nothing, I tell you. I, I was angry. It was something to say. Where were you last Wednesday afternoon? Brody twisted his fists tighter. In a motel. Now let me go. Brody eased his grip. With who? He said, praying to himself. God, don't let it be Ellen. Let his alibi be a good one. Daisy Wicker! You can check with her yourself. I will check, said Brody. You can count on it. Well, what do you say? Said Quint. We going today or not? Either way, Brody, it'll cost you. Brody felt shaken. He had to have time to think. He said to Quint, We'll go. With the cage? With the cage. If this idiot wants to kill himself, let him. Okay by me, said Quint. Let's get this circus on the road. Gradually, as the boat fell into the rhythm of the long ocean swells, Brody's fury dulled. Maybe Hooper was telling the truth. It was possible. By ten o'clock, a breeze had come up. Not strong, but fresh enough to ripple the water and cool the men, who sat and watched and said nothing. I'm gonna have a beer, said Brody, and started to climb the stairs, when he heard Quint's flat, calm voice say, There he is. Brody felt his pulse speed up. He stepped quickly onto the deck and said, Where? Right there, said Quint. Get off the stern. It took Brody's eyes a moment to adjust, but then he saw the fin. A ragged, brownish-gray triangle that sliced through the water, followed by the scythe tail sweeping left and right with short, spasmodic thrusts. The fish was at least 30 yards behind the boat, Brody guessed. Maybe 40. You sure it's him? He said. It's him, said Quint. Let's put the cage overboard, said Hooper. Hooper removed his shirt, sneakers, and trousers, and began to pull the neoprene diving suit over his legs. When he was dressed, Hooper fitted the regulator onto the neck of the air tank and opened the air valve. He sucked two breaths from the tank to make sure it was feeding air. Help me put this on, will you? He said to Brody. Brody lifted the air tank and held it while Hooper slipped his arms through the straps and fastened a third strap around his middle. Hooper stopped himself before he hit the bottom of the cage. He reached out to the hatch at the top of the cage and pulled it closed. I guess we can let go, said Brody. They released the ropes and let the cage descend until the hatch was about four feet beneath the surface. The only sounds Hooper could hear were those he made breathing. He turned around and looked up at the hull of the boat, a gray body that sat above him, bouncing slowly. He looked for the fish. Even with the bright sunlight, the visibility in the murky water was poor, no more than 40 feet. He glanced downward. Rising at him from the darkling blue, slowly, smoothly, was the shark. Hooper stared, enthralled, impelled to flee but unable to move. The fish came closer, silent as a shadow, and Hooper drew back. The head was only a few feet from the cage when the fish turned and began to pass before Hooper's eyes. Casually, as if in proud display of its incalculable mass and power. The snout passed first, then the jaw, slack and smiling, and then the black, fathomless eye seemingly riveted upon him. What the hell is he doing down there? said Brody. Why didn't he jab him with a gun? Quint didn't answer. He stood on the transom, harpoon clutched in his fist. 
Through the viewfinder of his camera, Hooper saw the fish turn towards him. Hooper raised his right hand to change the focus. Remember to change it again, he told himself, when it turns. But the fish did not turn. A shiver traveled the length of its body as it closed on the cage. It struck the cage head on, the snout ramming between two bars and spreading them. The snout hit Hooper in the chest and knocked him backward. The camera flew from his hands and the mouthpiece shot from his mouth. The fish turned on its side and the pounding tail forced the great body farther into the cage. Hooper groped for his mouthpiece but couldn't find it. His chest was convulsed with the need for air. It's attacking! screamed Brody. He grabbed one of the tether ropes and pulled, desperately trying to raise the cage. God damn your soul! Quint shouted. Gotta get him on the surface! Come up, you devil! The fish slid backward out of the cage and turned sharply to the right in a tight circle. It was then that Hooper saw the wide gap in the bars and saw the giant head lunging through it. He raised his hands above his head, grasping at the escape hatch. The fish rammed through the space between the bars, spreading them still farther with each thrust of its tail. Hooper, flattened against the back of the cage, saw the mouth reaching, straining for him. The fish thrust again, and Hooper saw, with the terror of doom, that the mouth was going to reach him. The jaws closed around his torso. Hooper felt a terrible pressure, as if his guts were compacted. He jabbed his fist into the black eye. The fish bit down. And the last thing Hooper saw before he died was the eye gazing at him through a cloud of his own blood. He's got him! cried Brody. Do something! That man is dead, Quint said. Oh, how do you know? We may be able to save him. He's dead. It's coming up, said Brody. Grab the rifle! Quint cocked his hand for the throw. The fish broke water 15 feet from the boat, surging upward in a shower of spray. Hooper's body protruded from each side of the mouth, head and arms hanging limply down one side, knees, calves, and feet from the other. Brody reached for the rifle, and Quint cast the harpoon. The target was huge, a field of white belly, and the distance was not too great for a successful throw above water. But as Quint threw, the fish began to slide down in the water, and the iron went high. For another instant, the fish remained on the surface, its head out of the water, Hooper hanging from its mouth. Shoot! Quint yelled. For God's sake, shoot! Brody shot without aim. The first two shots hit the water in front of the fish. The third, to Brody's horror, struck Hooper in the neck. The fish might never have been there. The water was calm. The only difference was that Hooper was gone. What do we do now? said Brody. What in the name of God can we do now? Quint said, I don't think we'll have to wait that long. He uncovered a sheep he had been saving for bait, tied a rope around its neck and lay it on the gunwale. He slashed its stomach and flung the animal overboard, letting it drift twenty feet from the boat before securing the rope to an aftercleat. Okay, now let's see how long it takes. The sky had lightened to full gray daylight, and in ones and twos, the lights on the shore flicked off. Brody's butt was sore from sitting on the hard transom. Suddenly, he saw the monstrous head of the fish not five feet away. So close he could reach over and touch it, black eyes staring at him, silver gray snout pointing at him, gaping jaw grinning at him. Oh, God, Brody said. There he is! Quint was down the ladder and at the stern in an instant. As he jumped onto the transom, the fish's head slipped back into the water and a second later slammed into the transom. The jaws closed on the wood and the head shook violently from side to side. Brody grabbed a cleat and held on, unable to look away from the eyes. The boat shuddered and jerked each time the fish moved its head. Quint slipped and fell to his knees on the transom. The fish let go and dropped beneath the surface and the boat lay still again. He was waiting for us said Brody. It don't matter, said Quint. We got him now. We've got him. Did you see what he did to the boat? Eh, give it a mighty good shake, didn't he? The rope holding the sheep tightened, shook for a moment, then went slack. Quint stood and picked up the harpoon. He's took the sheep. 
The dorsal fin and tail surfaced ten yards to the right of the stern and began to move again towards the boat. There you come, said Quint. There you come. He stood, legs spread, left hand on his hip, right hand extended to the sky, grasping the harpoon. When the fish was a few feet from the boat and heading straight on, Quint cast his iron. The harpoon struck the fish in front of the dorsal fin. Quint jumped to his feet and cried, Got ya, you devil! The boat lurched once and again, and there was the distant sound of crunching. Has he done any damage? said Brody. Some. We're riding a little heavy aft. He probably poked a hole in us. There's nothing to worry about. We'll pump her out. That's it, then, Brody said happily. Not quite. Look. He's chasing us? Quint nodded. Why? He can't still think we're food. No, he means to make a fight of it, and it's a fight he'll get. He picked up the harpoon. Excitement had returned to his face. Okay, he called. Come and get it. Brody saw the flat plane of gray pass along the starboard side of the boat, six feet beneath the surface. He's here, heading forward. The fish hit the bow head-on with a noise like a muffled explosion. Quint cast his iron. It struck the fish atop the head over the right eye, and it held fast. What do you think? Is he dead? I doubt it, but he may be close enough to it for us to throw a rope round his tail and drag him till he drowns. Quint took a coil of rope from one of the barrels in the bow. He tied one end to an after-cleat. The other end he tied into a noose. He climbed onto the gunwale, ran the rope through a pulley at the top of the gin pole and down the pole to the winch. He flipped the starter switch. As soon as the slack and the rope was taken up, the boat heeled hard to starboard, dragged down by the weight of the fish. Can that winch handle him? said Brody. Suddenly, the rope started coming too fast. It fouled on the winch, coiling in snarls. The boat snapped upright. Rope break? Damn it, no! said Quint, and now Brody saw fear in his face. Damn fish is coming up! He dashed to the controls and threw the engine into forward, but it was too late. The fish broke water right beside the boat. It rose vertically, and in an instant of horror, Brody gasped at the size of the body. The fish landed on the stern of the boat with a shattering crash, driving the boat beneath the waves. Water poured in over the transom. In seconds, Quint and Brody were standing in water up to their hips. The fish lay there, its jaw not three feet from Brody's chest. The body twitched, and in the black eye, as big as a baseball, Brody thought he saw his own image reflected. God damn your black soul, screamed Quint. He grabbed the harpoon dart at the end of the rope and with his hand plunged it into the soft white belly of the fish. Blood poured from the wound and bathed Quint's hands. The boat was sinking. The stern was completely submerged and the bow was rising. The fish rolled off the stern and slid beneath the waves. The rope attached to the dart Quint had stuck into the fish followed. Suddenly, Quint lost his footing and fell backward into the water. The knife! he cried, lifting his left leg above the surface, and Brody saw the rope coiled around Quint's foot. Brody could not move fast enough. He watched in helpless terror as Quint, reaching towards him with grasping fingers, eyes wide and pleading, was pulled slowly down into the dark water. For a moment there was silence, except for the sucking sound of the boat slipping gradually under. A seat cushion popped to the surface next to him, and Brody grabbed it. The water was up to Brody's shoulders, and he saw the tail and dorsal fin break the surface twenty yards away. The tail waved once left, once right, and the dorsal fin moved closer. Get away, damn you! The fish kept coming, barely moving. Brody clutched the cushion, and he found that by holding it in front of him and kicking constantly, he could stay afloat without exhausting himself. The fish came closer. It was only a few feet away, and Brody could see the conical snout. He screamed, an ejaculation of hopelessness, and closed his eyes, waiting for an agony he could not imagine. Nothing happened. He opened his eyes. The fish was nearly touching him, only a foot or two away, but it had stopped. And then, as Brody watched, 
the steel gray body began to recede downward into the gloom. Brody put his face into the water and opened his eyes. Through the stinging saltwater mist, he saw the fish sink in a slow and graceful spiral, trailing behind it the body of Quint, arms out to the sides, head thrown back, mouth open in mute protest. The dead fish faded from view, and Quint's body hung suspended, a shadow twirling slowly in the twilight. Brody raised his head, cleared his eyes, and sighted in the distance the black point of the water tower. Then, he began to kick toward shore. Jaws by Peter Benchley, read by John Garasio, and abridged and directed by John Taylor, was a Fiction Factory production.